Hey, you guys, so good that you're here today. We're going to continue our series today, Behind the Scenes, uh, talking about the local church. And the reason why we want to take you behind the scenes, because what we see on the outside isn't always that goes on in the inside. And when we're talking about the church, and I can't believe this, I want you to really think about this. One year ago, one year ago this Sunday, we had to strictly go online with the rest of the nation. And our state would be one of the most shut down states in the union. But yet we are here and we're still together. We're still a church and we're still healthy and we're still worshiping. And one thing that we learned that the church is not a building. The church is not an organization. The church isn't just pastors, but the church is all of us. And my Jake, I love the way he used to say it when he was about four. He said, Daddy, he said, we is the church. Can I say, that's who we are. We is the church. Now, when you begin to think about church, and I think about church, and we think about church, I want you to think about four arrows that go in four different directions. Number one, we're going to begin to think about our relationship to God. We're going to go down and we're going to think about our relationship to the devil, which we covered last week. We'll think about our relationship to the world, then our relationship to one another. So these arrows move simultaneously or in great synchronization where we exist to be in a relationship with God. So look at this. Number one, our first role is to God, not even to one another. Some people say, well, the church is for people. Yes, it is. But the church first is for God and we worship God. God. Then last week, we see, if you look here, that the church, we have a relationship with the devil, and what that is, that the devil is totally defeated, that he has been 100% conquered on the cross. I want to say it this way. If you have a thinking, you have a theology, you have a philosophy that the devil on the cross beat Jesus Turn it today, because on the cross, Jesus Christ completely defeated the devil, and we are not... We are not fighting to get victory. We're fighting from a place of victory. Are you with me? So we, we, we worship, we conquer, today we reach. Do you see that? We are here to reach the world. We're not of the world, but we're in the world. And we're here to reach every person, every family, every language. We want to reach everybody with the good news of Jesus Christ. And next week, we will talk, the arrow moves to us or believers. We're here to edify. Now, schools of theology will say it this way. They use at least three E words. They'd say, first of all, the church exists to exalt God. That's why we love that song that they wrote, because we are exalting God. Can I just stop for a moment right now? Stop making the current situation of your life in our nation bigger than it should be. Come on, exalt God in the things of this earth will grow strangely dim and small. You know how my pastor used to say it? We serve a big, big God in a little bitty, tiny devil. Come on. We don't serve the devil. Come on. You know, you're with me. I don't know why that got that one messed up. Everyone say exalt God. Then with the world, the word would be evangelize or the evangelization of the world. Then we begin to speak about us. We edify one another. When I go to church, and I do, I don't like sitting by people in the same road that put me down. I want someone to build me up. Man, you look good today. Thank you. Man, that sweater looks great on you. I want to be edified. Are you with me? So we exalt, we evangelize, we edify. Now, if there was an E word, I guess we could say this. We eviscerate the devil which means we remove him out of our thinking, out of our land, out of our state. And I want to commit something to you and I have been pondering. After last week's sermon on conquering the devil, can I tell you right now, I am committing to you, I'm committing to myself, I'm committing to this church, we are going to have more groups, more classes on freedom. Because Jesus Christ died, not that we would be defeated or mediocre, that we would 100% live in victory in every area of our life. Come on. Are you with me? But today we're going to begin to talk about reach. If you have your Bibles, go with, to, with me, to me, not to me, go with me to Matthew chapter 28. And I want to begin to think about that one word, reach. Now, reach literally means that you're extending. Watch my arm. Watch my arm. Watch me. Watch me. 
that you're extending your arm to grasp something or someone. Now, let me say it this way. When I'm walking with Jack, Lucy, or Rio, my Quincy's not really walking, kind of walking, and we're in the neighborhood, and if Jack or Lucy or Rio darts out to the street, what do I do? We, back here, I, we will reach and we grasp them and we pull them back to spare them or protect them. Now, when it comes to the church, the word reach, remember we exalt, we exalt God, we worship God, we've conquered the devil, we're conquering the devil, but we're here to reach the world. The church isn't just here to worship on Sunday. We're here to reach the world. Are you with me? And so when it comes to us, that means we overextend ourselves for other people, that we reach out and we extend ourselves for other people. Now, I want to ask two questions this morning as we go through this talk, this sermon, what we're speaking about today. Who are you following and who is following you? Who are you following and who is following you? And I want to say it this way. Does your life, does my life, does our life, when we leave this place, does it push people away from God or does it compel people to come to God? Does my life push people away or does it compel them to come to God? We want to reach people. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 28. It's the Great Commission. It's on evangelism. It's on reaching the world. And Jesus spoke it. And it says here in Matthew 28, and we're going to look at verse 18. And I love this. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority, not some, not half, that all authority has been given unto me, Get this, in heaven and on earth. So in heaven he has authority, on earth he has authority, and I will tell you, under the earth he has authority. And because he has all authority, look at the next word, it says, go, therefore, and make disciples. I'm going to say that again. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Did you get that? Of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And it goes on and it says this, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Everyone say go. No, it's amazing when we first heard this scripture And I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I was raised Catholic, but we weren't good Catholics. Uh, We would leave right after communion. Uh, Sometimes we'd even go to mass intoxicated, didn't feel any guilt about that. But in 1980, I began to pray, God, uh, I need you in my life. And I don't know why I pray that. I was partying every weekend. And I would have an aunt. She didn't just go to a cute church. She went to one of those crazy churches. It was one of those Pentecostal churches that you just wouldn't go to. And and so it was a Sunday night. I'll never forget. And I would go to this uh, church. And they were crazy. People were dancing. They had their hand. People were doing. I mean, they were dancing in church. And I saw dancing, but never in church. And, And so I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And within two weeks. Get me. Now, I want to uh, recite this verse. It says, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore. Go therefore. I heard that 41 years ago. Go therefore. And so the way they taught go is you had to go on the street corner and begin to preach. And they said, hey, you've given your life to Jesus Christ. Now you have to go therefore and you have to preach. And so I thought, well, no, I'm not going to preach, but I will go and I'll help you. I'll just stand in the back and kind of pray. Well, you'll never guess where they all went, outside the bar where everybody used to go and party. And so they have a car. They have a big speaker on the car. They plug the speaker into a battery to get it uh, amped up. And they said, Jude, it's your time to testify. Have you ever heard that? Testify. And and I'm thinking, oh, no, no, I'll just pray. Because for me, uh, I I wanted my faith to be private and personal. You know what I'm talking about? Nobody's business. I just didn't want anyone to find out that I'm now a little bit of a Jesus freak. And so the next thing I know, they shoved the mic in my hand. And I know I was shaking and a little bit nervous. and, And all of a sudden, something came on me. And you said, do you remember what you said? I just said, you guys, all I know... It's two Saturdays ago, I was partying, partying, I can't even say it. And then I went to church and Jesus found me 
And I started preaching, and right when I started preaching, one of my uncles comes out of the bar, (laughs) and he tells my whole family, Jews crazy, he's got Jesus, he's now preaching. (laughs) And you see, in my mind, I thought go meant go on the street corner, go to a nation, Go somewhere five hours away where they really need preaching. But in the Greek, in the original language, that isn't go to the street corner. But it is as you go. It's a passive verb. Get this. It's a passive verb. It means as you go to Little League games, as you go to Trader Joe's, as you go play golf, as you go to work, as you go walking in the neighborhood, as you go get a pedicure. Can I get a witness, ladies? Come on. As you go, make disciples. Are you with me? As you go, make disciples. As you go, are you going to say that with me? Make disciples. You want to say it with me? I know you do. As you go, make disciples. Now, get this. Remember, we're here to reach the world. We're exalting God. We conquer the devil. We reach the world. There are two ways to reach. Two ways to reach. There is salt and there is light. Did you get that? There is salt and there is light. Go with me to Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5. There's two ways to reach. Now get this. We reach people as a scattered people and as a gathered people. Did you get that? We reach people two ways. Number one, we're salt and we're light. We're scattered and then we gather. All right, here we go. This is Matthew. I'm going to read it from the Eugene Peterson paraphrase. So, so good, it's better than a breakfast burrito. Okay, here we go. Verse 13, Matthew 5. Let me tell you why you are here. It's Jesus speaking. He's telling us why we're here as a church. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out God flavors in the earth. So we're here to bring about a God flavor in everyone. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? I want to read that again. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to park the car. How, if I lose my saltiness, how will people taste godliness? If I lose my saltiness, how will people taste godliness? Saltiness, then we see, is godliness. And godliness isn't speaking in a special language that only people at church know. Saltiness is godliness. And godliness is not legalism. Godliness is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Let's read on. It says you've lost your youthfulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You are here to be light, bringing out God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going to public with this. Are you with me? We're going public with this. Are you with me? And he goes, I love this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a lampstand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop on a lampstand, shine. I'm going to say it again and you're going to say it with me. Shine. I'm going to say it one more time. Shine. I'm going to do it one more time and maybe sing to you this morning. Shine this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Say this little light of mine. Ah, Don't let the devil snuff it out, all right? It says shine. Keep open house. You say, well, how do I shine? Get this. Keep open house and be generous. It didn't say speak weird to him, but it means you're open and you're generous. You're open and you're generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Everyone say, salt of the earth, light of the world. Let's do it this way. Say, salt of the earth, city on a hill. Now, I want to begin to talk to you. 2,000 years ago, when Jesus said this, when he talked about being salt and not losing its saltiness, you know where they got the salt from? From the Dead Sea. Several years ago, many of us, 30 of us, in fact, went to Israel, and we were floating in the Dead Sea. There's so much salt there, you become buoyant. You just float. You will not sink. Even if you're a non-swimmer, you can float because it's that buoyant. Now, get this. They would get their salt from the salt sea. And if the salt they 
got from the Dead Sea, not Salt Sea, you could call it the Salt Sea, but the Dead Sea, if they got the salt from there, the salt would be surrounded by other minerals around the salt. And if those outer minerals that uh, surrounded the salt got within the salt, it would lose its properties of being salty. And what Jesus was saying, do not let that which is around you in culture influence the salt, the godliness in your life. Because if your godliness is influenced by that which is around you, then you can't influence that which is around you. Can I tell you, we cannot change the world if we're being changed by the world. Did you get that? We can't change the world. My salt can't bring flavor if my salt is now without flavor because it has other minerals in it. I'm here, you're here to change the world. But wait a minute, how can I change the world if I can't change the nation? And how can I change the nation if I can't change California? And how can I change California if we cannot change Ventura County, L.A. County, from Westlake all the way to Santa Paula, Fillmore, Santa Barbara? And how can I change the city in which I live if I cannot even change my family, my neighborhood, those I work with. And you see, that's why God doesn't want this to be a turn or burn expedition. Hey, turn or burn. That is not evangelism. That's bizarre. Are you with me? God wants us as we live our life to be salt, godly in this world. Are you with me? Now get this, you say, why salt? Number one, it flavors food, all right? Egg without salt is just bland. So people, when they get around our godliness, begin to wake up to the goodness of God. Number two, I want to tell you why they used salt 2,000 years ago. If you had chicken or a steak, they didn't have refrigeration. So they would rub salt in the ch- on the chicken, in the steak. Why? To preserve it. Please hear me. I'm going to hold up my Bible so you think I'm serious. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Of course we're to worship. Of course we need to recognize we've conquered the enemy. But we're here to reach the world. Why? Why? Because we are a preservative. And all that's happening in the United States, in California right now, can I tell you, I do not know if I believe it's going to be this one or that one that is going to preserve. We are the salt of the earth, and we are called to preserve this nation. And without us having a godly influence, everyone say scattered. Say it again. We are scattered. People get this without that. The world, our culture becomes like an avocado. It's cut open. Then it begins to rot and decay. The world does not know how to heal itself. And you cannot legislate this salt. But what we have on the inside of us is God himself. And God has got the quality to heal and to preserve. Come on. Woo, my goodness. And... Salt heals. It heals. Now, let me tell you what my boys used to do. I, I, don't know, I don't know if girls do this. That's why I only wanted girls, but we had three boys. We'd go to Chili's. We'd go to Red Robin, and, and Becky would either be on her phone. She'd always order some type of salad with no dressing, and it was gross, and no croutons, and she may have went to the restroom, and, and this, she, I still see it. I will think about this forever. She'd go to the restroom when she's talking to her friend on the phone. they get the salt shaker. And they would begin to unscrew the top of the salt shaker. And then they'd put it down. And I don't know. She should have known after the 50th time. (laughs) They would put the salt shaker right in front of where her plate was. And she goes, oh, I need some salt. And then all of a sudden, she'd go to sprinkle it, lightly sprinkle it. The cap would come off and a mountain of salt would come right there. She goes, ah. And you know what? She'd go, boys, you ruined my food. But she'd get it back and she'd get a coupon to get three more salads. You know, I don't know how she did that. (laughs) It's her spiritual gift. (laughs) Kid you not. Got our bill paid for and 30 other tables paid for. So I don't know, you know. Kid you not. Can I tell you right now? One of the reasons our family, our friends, and our neighbors do not come to Christ is because we gang up on them. Salt was never meant to be gathered. It was meant to be scattered lightly throughout. And it starts with our family. And let me tell you what salt is. 
Salt is not only preaching the gospel, but is living the gospel. Okay, that went over like a big lead balloon. I'm going to say it one more time. I'll just say what Mother Teresa said. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. She said it three times. Preach the gospel and whenever necessary, use words. You know, I went to that crazy church. It was Pentecostal. It was loud. I mean, they sang and cried. Ugly crying. Ugly singing. It wasn't cute. It wasn't California. Lord knows. My mom, who definitely, she would not, and she even said, I will never accept your Jesus. She goes, I will always be as I am. I kid you not. What, you know what I said? I said, yeah, and you'll go to hell just like you are. Wow, that's pretty salty, huh? <laughs> that's what we think salt is. That's not salt. That has the minerals of self-righteousness. Oh, okay. So she said, Jude, cut the grass. I said, Mom, I have Bible study on Monday, church on Wednesday, prayer worship night on Friday, street evangelism on Saturday, and Sunday morning church and Sunday night church. Three weeks went by. She kept on asking me, but my mom was smart. Mama was from Louisiana. So she wrote me a big note. In the name of Jesus... Praise the Lord. Jude, kid you not. Jude, cut the grass. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Mama. I mean, you know I cut the grass. I don't know about you, but 41 years ago when I read that the Philippian jailer and his family got saved and Stephanus and Corinthians, his family got saved. I was not going to hell. I was not, number one, I was not going to go to hell, but I wasn't going to heaven alone. And I was not going to heaven and have mama, my brother, and my two sisters going to somewhere else. And I knew when it said preach the gospel, it wasn't go to Africa, go to Asia, go to the mall, go to the street corner. But the first people as I would go would be my family. And yes, they would see my humanity and they'd see my faults and they'd see my weaknesses. But through it all, they would see that my life was changing and that salt agent was working in me and it could work in them. Come on. Everyone say, as you go. go. And and that's that's the key. It's as you go. It says, I've been given. Jesus already said. Stop griping about what's going on. Well, it's shut down. I don't know what to do. Hey, all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. And go, therefore, into the world and make disciples. Everyone say, salt of the earth. earth. Say, "Light light of the world. Now, let me just tell you this. He didn't just say light of the world. He said, you are a city on a hill. And I want you to get this. We are the salt of the earth. We as a church, we scattered. Listen, we're gathered right now. But as we leave this place, we go to all our spheres of influence. And we should just bring a little salt with us because salt is in us. Are you with me? But then yet we are called to be a city on a hill. Now, I want to begin to tell you this and we'll end. All right. When I used to think the light of the world, I used to think of one little light. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it. And I always used to think... Like a candle in the wind, the enemy could come and snuff it out. Can I tell you, first of all, I didn't originate the light. I was in darkness. Our God is a God of light. I was like the book of Genesis when the earth was covered and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God came to Jude Fuquay and said, let there be light. I am not the originator of light. Just like the moon and the stars do not originate or generate light, they just reflect light. Can I say, when you're called out of darkness and you come into his marvelous light. You have an eternal light that's in you that no wind, no devil, no circumstance can ever blow it out. Come on. However, he didn't just say light of the world. He says, you are a city on a hill. Now, I don't know about you, but living in Ventura, Santa Barbara, and where we live, Westlake, I want you to think about this. When I come home from LAX or Burbank Airport, one of my favorite things is to drive over the Caneo Gray, and it's dark and it's at night, and when you start coming, you see the lights of Camarillo, 
Oxnard, Ventura, maybe Santa Paula, you begin to see those lights. Can I say right now, we are living in some of the darkest times that the church has ever known. However, we're not just individual, weak, uh, volatile lights. We are a city set on a hill. And they may think they could cancel us and bring us down, but God has elevated us. Come on. Are you with me on that? You see, we are effective when we scatter and reach the individual people in our life. But we are powerful as we gather. Now, the team is going to come up. I want to tell you this. Uh, several years ago, when the Thomas fires came and almost, it tried to wipe out Ventura, you guys were so gracious. Watch me, watch me. You know how he says you open up? You open people up by opening up your lives and then that you become generous. There's someone here today, I'm not even going to call them out. I'm such a caller out, or I want to call them out so bad and it's so good. My motto is, never ever come to church alone. They got more than two rows filled. You say, what is that? That's salt, and that's like, but get this, get this. Several years ago, you gave so much money, we had $100,000 extra from the Thomas Fires money. When we went to the city of Ventura and we said we want to give to the Aurora Grande Park where the child structure has been burnt and we want this new play structure to have, uh, be able to be accessible to special needs children and we presented the city with no strings attached, a hundred thousand dollar check. The mayor and the council people began to weep and said we have never seen anything like that. Can I say there's going to be a new image of the church and our reaching is not just going to be preaching I, I got to say that one again our reaching is not going to just be preaching it's going to be giving and serving and loving and helping and restoring are you with me now look I'm going to hey Julie will you do me a favor I don't even need this I'm going to have you take this table Everyone say, all authority. He says this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Okay, I'm not going to have you say it anymore. You can. You want to? Oh, I felt a little bit tension. Oh, I wanted to. All right, I'll let you. Because of that, he says, go. Say that with me. Say it again. That's not the main word. That's not the main word. As you go to the Little League, as you go to Trader Joe's, as you go to Starbucks, as you go wherever you want to go, then this is the key thought. Make disciples. Make dis Oh, I know I felt that one. Oh. He's going to ask us to do something. I'm already busy. He wants me to go to a class and bring... No, no, no. Make disciples. Don't get this. In the Greek, it's only one word. Discipleizing. As you go, discipleize. That doesn't make sense, but that's how it would be in the Greek. As you go, disciple life. Now, let's begin to think, what is a disciple? What is a disciple? It is a follower of Jesus. Jesus did not come to the earth just to get someone to believe in him, but to make a disciple. Okay, let me explain to you. 2,000 years ago, the reason why Jesus would use this word, 2,000 years ago, you know what Josephus said? He was a Jewish historian. He said the Jewish people pride themselves in the education, please get this, of their children. Now, I just want to stop right now for a moment. Can I breathe? Right now, in our nation, the thing that grieves me one year later is the education of our children. In the Jewish person, that was their greatest Prime at the age of six, a Jewish young person would go to a synagogue, and from six to ten, they called it the house of the book. Like synagogues today, it may be Beth Torah, Bethlehem, house of bread, Beth Torah, house of the book. Get this from six to ten, the Jewish young person would memorize the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, if you were like, who's who? You're really bright. The rabbi. And when you think of rabbi back then, 
That would be like a celebrity. That would be like an artist. That would be like a sports star. The rabbi was something. The rabbi would come to that person and they would say these three words. Come, follow me. Now, if you didn't do that well, they'd give them a rejection letter. Go back to your family's business and continue to learn your family's business. Now, get this. From the age of about 11 to 14, Beth, it was called the house of learning. And you'll never guess how they learn by asking questions. And that's why the Catholic Church would come up with catechism, spiritual learning through questions. Now, before Jesus' public ministry, the last thing that's ever said of him, he was 12 years old, so we know he made it through the house of the book. Jesus fully knew Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And he was in that next phase, the house of learning. And you say, how do you know that? He was in the synagogue. He was sitting, he was asking questions, and they were asking him questions. Now, I want to stop for a moment. What grieves me right now is how many young people that have been at home for a year and so many things in their lives, in their mind, are being put to question. Who am I? What is my identity? What is my orientation? And it seems like questions, like a battering ram, are coming to them. And can I tell you, if you ask the wrong questions, you'll get the wrong answers. But if you begin to ask the right questions, you can get some godly answers. Come on. Now get this. We're ending. We're ending. We're going to sing this song. So the rabbi, the coach, the mentor, the teacher, the boss... If you did really well at the learning in those questions, they'd say three words. Come, follow me. Now, if you didn't do that well, the SAT really made your brain freeze. They go, it's a rejection letter. Go home and continue to learn your family's business. Now, from 14 to 18, you memorize the rest of the Bible. It was called the house of study. Now, listen to this. Jesus Christ would come on the scene. You would never guess what they called him. Rabbi. So he must have went through the house of the book, the house of learning, and the house of study. And you see, if you were a rabbi, you went to the who's who. Where's the valedictorian? Where's the salutatorian? Where are those who are going to Princeton, Berkeley, Yale, Harvard? Where are those? No, that's not Jesus. Jesus doesn't work that way and he doesn't call that way. And you say, why are we here? We to go and not get people to believe, but to make disciples. And you say, what is a disciple? It's someone who follows. So you'll never guess. Jesus goes to the worst ones. The ones who flunked out. The ones who didn't make it. Maybe you're not making it. They had two brothers, James and John, in their father's boat, mending his nets. You know what that means? They didn't make it. They got a rejection letter. What was your rejection letter this year? And you know what he says? Come, follow me. And immediately, they dropped their nets and they followed him. Now, Jesus, man... He wants to reach everybody. The other rabbis only went to the best of the best and only those who were Jewish. Not Jesus. He goes to Levi. He goes to Luke, a Gentile. And he says, follow me. Now get this. When they said, those rabbis said, follow me, you know what they were saying? To the disciple, they're saying, you're going to be so close to me that the dust when I walk is going to get all over you and you will be covered with my dust and get this and you will become like I am that day you know why Peter James John all of them you know why they clearly left everything not that they would know everything he knew but that they would become just like Jesus can I tell you the goal of City Church California as we go we're going to influence as we follow him they're going to follow us somebody's following you you know I don't want to just oh no you are discipling are you pushing them away from God Are you compelling him to God?
And it starts with your family, your friends, your co-workers. Now, let me just, this is where I end. We're going to sing the song, I promise you. It's so good. Can you give me two minutes? Who will give me a minute? One minute, two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, six. Okay, I got 20 more minutes, thank God. <laughs> Get this. I want you to think about this. Oh my gosh. The Jewish people said this, and they still say this. The Torah, and I believe this, is the way, the truth, and the life. And they spent their lives to study and to live the Torah because it would be the best way to live. Jesus comes on the scene, mixes it up. He said, no, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the Torah. And when my dust gets on you, you may be dirty, but I'll wash your feet and I'll write in your dirt. And I made you from the dust and I'll remake you from my dust in Jesus' name. That God Almighty became dust that he can write in your dirt. Woo! Somebody get up here, up in here. Stand up, stand up. How many need God to write in your dirt? Come on, following Jesus. And the closer I am to Jesus, the more I become like Jesus. Are you with me? Are you with me? Okay, this is where we are. We are ending. If you would say, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not following Jesus. I believe in Jesus, but I'm not following Jesus. Jesus didn't come to make believers, but followers. Go therefore, disciplize. Cause people to follow me. I believed in Jesus, but 41 years ago, holy God, he should have never called me. But you know what? I remind you almost every day. You know what you got when you called me. And if you didn't want that, you should have went to Nordstrom's. You should have went to the Grove. You should have went to State Street. But you decided to go to the thrift store and pick out a garment that's been tattered, torn, and ruined. That's who you chose. But you said, if I follow you, somehow you will make me like you, Lord. Come on. That's what I want. So today you would say I have believed but I want to follow Jesus with everything I want to follow Jesus on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday Thursday, Friday and Saturday I want to follow him with everything and that's Romans 10 if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died and he was raised from the dead and you say that with your mouth you know where preaching begins? Saying, Jesus is real to me. He's Lord in my life. That's where it begins. If that is you, I want you to raise your hand right now. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Clap. Stop. Cheer. Now, I want us to pray this. Everybody's going to pray this. Say, Jesus, forgive me. I can't believe it. Say that. I can't believe it. You call me, I'm going to follow you. Come into my life, forgive me of my sins, be the Lord of my life. And I say it, and I say it. The greatest thing that happened to me, I, I feel very uncomfortable trying to do public preaching like that. But let me tell you what it did do. I couldn't go back. After my uncle saw me, it's something about saying it with your mouth. I'm not a dude who goes to the mall and says, here, read this. I mean, it, it would scare me. Becky is into that. It, it, there's no such thing. Faith starts private. Faith starts personal. But then it becomes very public. Very public. And I don't think you need to wear a WWJD bracelet or a rhinestone Jesus pin. Come on, man. You don't need that rhinestone Jesus pin. Your life has been changed. My friend said, hey, what's wrong with you? You're not cussing as much. I had the worst potty mouth of any human being. 
It's cleaned up. Still has a ways to go. Especially in this last year, my goodness. My Lord, you began and you better finish it right now before I hurt myself. <laughs> Becky will call me, Pastor Jude. I go, be quiet. <laughs> now I want you to do this. Just maybe do this. Or this. Or just do this. Or do this. I don't care. Almighty God, we want to follow you. I want to follow you. And you said, Lord, and I do believe you've been given all authority in heaven and earth. And you told me to go. As I go to Trader Joe's 24-hour fitness, somehow I'm to cause a thirst and an attraction to people to want to follow you. And that they could follow me as I follow you. And God, I'm asking that. I want to reach California. I want California to be reached, oh Lord. God, I pray, Lord, from Ventura to the great Orange County, from San Diego to small Reading, from San Francisco to Hollywood. God, we want to reach California as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. In the name of Jesus. Wow, it's so good to experience church together. If this message spoke to you, or maybe you want to revisit this or others like it, you can go to our YouTube channel and experience that anytime on demand. That's there right for you. Maybe you even want to share that with someone. I know that I've done that in this time. and It's a great way to share the gospel with people. Also, I want to remind you, Thursday night, 6.30 Pacific Standard Time, we're going to have live prayer and worship. It's an amazing time. And one more quick reminder, next Sunday, our 7 a.m. will not be a way for you to experience church at home. But our 9 and our 11 will be in conjunction with in person. We'll all be together. It's going to be an amazing time. Don't miss it. Maybe you just invite some friends over. You can watch it at home. It's going to be a wonderful time. We love you, City Church, and have an amazing week.